Mr. President. The Senator from California. I thank the Majority Leader for uh, allowing me this time to proceed. Um, as I was saying, it's, it's one thing to rewrite history a few years after it passes. It's another thing to rewrite it while you're still living through it. And to say that this economic recovery is a Republican recovery is kind of funny and strange. Um, in fact, the year 2014 was the best year for job creation since 1999, and it could have been a lot better uh, in 2014 and the prior years if our Republican friends hadn't filibustered every single job proposal that President Obama put forward. And, uh, you know, it's sad because we would have been here at a much quicker moment. Uh, the economy added almost 3 million jobs in 2014, averaging almost 250,000 jobs a month. The unemployment rate has fallen to 5.6%, and most of that decline, and here's the good news, came from long-term unemployed workers getting back to work. GDP growth has accelerated, reaching an annualized rate of 5% in the third quarter of 2014. This is the best GDP growth we've seen in over 10 years. Our economic recovery has been long, it's been tough, but it is happening. And thank you, President Obama, for your leadership. We've added 11.2 million private sector jobs since February 2010. That's the longest streak of recorded private sector job gains in American history. The stock market, the stock market has bounced back from the crash. It's added more than 10,000 points, reaching an all-time high of over 18,000 points. And our annual deficit has been reduced by almost two-thirds. Our deficit has been reduced by almost two-thirds. Now, I think it's important to put into context the job growth under presidents, Democratic and Republican, because I think we need to look at private sector job growth. And this is an extraordinary chart. Under George Herbert Walker Bush, there were 1.5 million jobs created in his uh, term of office. Bill Clinton, 21.2 million. I've seen that number up to 23, but that's probably when you include public sector. But private sector, 21.2 million jobs. Under George W. Bush, a loss of 460,000 jobs. <clears throat> Under President Obama, a gain so far of 7 million and he has two years to go, and we're just moving forward. This says to me that we Democrats know what we're doing. And if you want to look at deficits, that's another day's speech. You know, it was Bill Clinton that balanced the budget. It was W. Bush who unbalanced it, put two wars on a credit card, and gave a tax cut to the rich, and we had terrible deficits. And it was Barack Obama who has now reduced this deficit by two-thirds. So I say all this leading up to my discussion of the Keystone Pipeline. How does that even connect? Well, I'll tell you. When a new majority takes over in the Congress, you know the first bill that they take up symbolizes their priorities. And of all the things that they pick, all the things that they pick, they pick a bill that in terms of permanent job creation uh, will be 35 jobs. And that's proven uh, by the State Department, 35 long-term uh, jobs. And you have to wonder, uh, why are they doing this? And I believe I know the answer. This is really a, a big hug and a big kiss to big oil and Canadian interests. That's what it's about. Otherwise, why wouldn't we turn to the highway bill? Mr. President, I think you and I know that we have worked across party lines on that issue, and it's millions of jobs for Americans, good jobs, long-lasting jobs, rebuilding our bridges, rebuilding our highways, rebuilding our roads, making sure we have transit systems that work. We have a terrible record in terms of our bridge condition today. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of bridges are not in good shape. And we have seen bridges fail, and we know the outcome. 
Why are we doing something for Canadian oil business interests that they will make billions off instead of doing something for America? America, like building our infrastructure. This bill isn't about helping American workers or, or families. Let's be very clear. It does nothing. Again, when I say 35 permanent jobs, I'm not making that up. That's in the final supplemental environmental impact statement, which I believe the Republicans want to make final, right? So they're accepting it. The Republicans are accepting the fact that there's 35 permanent jobs because they, in their language, say, we approve of the final supplemental environmental impact statement, which is where it says there'll be 35 permanent jobs. Now, yes, there's temporary jobs for two years, a couple of thousand. But the fact is we can have millions of jobs when we rebuild our infrastructure. We got 400 new jobs coming to the Imperial Valley in my home state because we have lithium there, and uh, they're going to start producing it. 400 jobs, just one little project. This is 35 jobs for Americans. You've got to be kidding. This is what you got for us after all that blood, sweat, and tears in the election? I, I just think wasting another minute on the tar sands project doesn't make any sense. A multi-year surface transportation bill is what we need. We still have unemployed people in the construction industry. So we have 600,000 construction workers remaining out of work. What are we giving them? 2,000 uh, temporary jobs and 35 permanent jobs. Let's do a highway bill. And by the way, the trust fund is running dry, and in four months will be completely dry. Let's step up to the plate and do our job, not do the job for the Canadian oil interests. I, I don't get it. I don't think it makes sense because I know we've worked together on transportation projects. And, and we're worried. Billions of dollars going to our states, whether it's Oklahoma, California, Nevada, name it, East Coast, West Coast, the funding's going to be delayed or stopped. And all these little short-term extensions that the House did are absolutely irresponsible. It doesn't provide stability to our local governments, to our businesses. So we know what we have to do. We have to invest in our aging infrastructure. No country can be great if we don't have an infrastructure that moves people and, and moves goods. And again, 50% of our nation's roads are in less than good condition. 63,000 bridges are structurally deficient. Let's do something for America. America. That's what we're here for, not to do something good for Canadian oil companies. Let's focus on what's good for the people. Now let's turn to this uh, infrastructure project, the Keystone Pipeline. I want to say unequivocally, and I don't have any doubts because I will source everything I say, everything I say, that from extraction to transportation to refining to waste storage, misery follows the tar sands. That's the oil they're going to put in. It's the dirtiest oil. I think XL stands for extra lethal. So a pipeline is a pipeline. Fine. It's what you put in it. This is the filthiest, most polluted kind of oil. Tar sands oil contains levels of toxic pollutants and metals that are much higher than conventional crude oil. 11 times more sulfur and nickel, six times more nitrogen, five times more lead than conventional crude oil. Who is that saying that? Is it Barbara Boxer? No. Let me source it. The USGS. The U.S. Geological Survey, the heavy oil and natural bitumen resources and geological basins of the world, 2007, documented. Tar sands equal the dirtiest oil. Why are my Republican friends and some of my Democratic friends, I, I admit that, I know there's a few, want to rush to bring this filthy oil into our country? The only benefit is to the Canadian oil interests. And that fact is, we need less pollution, not more pollution. 
Now, higher levels of dangerous air pollutants and carcinogens have been documented downwind from the tar sands refineries. People in nearby communities are suffering higher rates and types of cancers, like leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Again, is this me saying it? Some right-wing blog took me to task. The last time I said this, they said, oh, she's standing on the floor and making stuff up. OK, let's be clear. I'm not making stuff up. I'm telling the truth. And I'm going to document it in every case. Significantly higher levels of volatile compounds and carcinogens were found downwind of tar sands processing facilities. There were elevated rates of cancers linked to these toxic chemicals, including leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Where does this come from? Simpson, I.J. et al. Characterization of trace gases measured over Alberta sands mining operations. 76 speciated C2, C10 volatile organic compounds, and they list what they are. This is from two peer-reviewed papers. Is this what the Republicans do first? I thought we wanted to make people healthy. It's one thing they want to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which now in my state has reduced the uninsured by close to 50%. That's bad enough. Now they want to bring in this oil and help the Canadian oil people, and it's going to bring all these carcinogens and all of this pollution uh, to our country. Now, we already know. I visited with the people from Port Arthur, Texas, where they have these refineries. Look at this picture, Mr. President. A picture is worth a thousand words. I know that is a cliche, but it's a fact. I could try to explain to you what happens near a playground when this stuff is refined. And you might say, oh, that's nice, Barbara, but, you know, is you really making this up? No. Here it is. Look at it. They suffer asthma, respiratory ailments, skin irritations, and cancer. This is what happens right near a playground. Now, there are some politicians down there who say, bring it on. We want it. We like it. But talk to the real people there who live there with children. They have enough of tar sands. They're up to here with it. They don't want more of it. They want less of it. They want none of it. And let's not forget about the waste. See, once they burn all this stuff, they have waste left over. It's called pet coke, petroleum coke. Look at this. This is what it looks like. And it's stored all over. Now, a lot of, in the Midwest, a lot of it is stored in the Midwest. And what happens? If you look at this, it's not wet, so it can blow in the wind. Billowing black clouds have contaminated our children. They contain heavy metals. Children playing baseball have been forced off the field to seek cover from the clouds of black dust that pelted homes and cars. I think, do we have another picture of that one? OK. And this happened. This is why my friend Senator Durbin is so concerned, because it happened to his little little league players in the Chicago area. When inhaled, these particles can increase the number and severity of asthma attacks. They can <coughs> aggravate bronchitis. I'm coughing just at the thought of it. Lung diseases, they reduce the body's ability to fight infections. Now, where does that come from? I say it again. When inhaled, these particles can increase the number and severity of asthma attacks, cause or aggravate bronchitis and other lung diseases, and reduce the body's ability to fight infections. What's the source of that? California Air Resources Board, Air Pollution Particulate Matter Brochure, and dated May 6, 09. So I don't know how exposing Americans to this kind of pollution is in the national interest. I believe instead of waiving all the environmental reports like my Republican friends do in their uh, bill, they ought to call for more studies on the health impact of the tar sands oil so our families know what they're going to get with this pipeline. 
Now also there are spills to worry about. There are spills to worry about. Not only will the Keystone tar sands pipeline be harmful to the human health, but it hurts environment and communities located because if there's a spill, this is the toughest kind of oil to clean up. Um, here's the source for that. The EPA NEPA compliance comment letter State Department, that's what they talk about. Now, I'll tell you something. We have had spills at the tar sands, spills in Michigan, spills in Arkansas. If you don't believe me, ask those folks. Do you know in 2010, Mr. President, a pipeline ruptured and spilled over a million gallons of tar sands oil into the Kalamazoo River in Michigan? The local health department ordered the evacuation of 50 households and approximately 100 families were advised not to drink the water. The Michigan spill was the largest inland spill in U.S. history, and more than four years and a billion dollars later, it is not cleaned up. So wait a minute. You know, let's review. Republicans take over. The first bill they'd give us is the tar sands bill. The only people it helps, in my opinion, backed up by fact, are Canadian oil interests. The only jobs it creates permanently is 35 jobs. And what it does to our health is a disaster because the tar sands oil, it's the most toxic, dirtiest type of oil. And if there's a spill, it's the hardest to clean up. Who do you think's paying the billion dollars to clean up the tar sands spill in Michigan? I can tell you, it's probably mostly the government. Maybe, maybe we're trying to collect some from the private sector. Now, if you don't believe me about Michigan, let's turn to Mayflower, Arkansas. Look at this. This is a neighborhood, a beautiful neighborhood of homes. This is filthy, dirty, disgusting oil, and the camera's taking pictures of it. In 2013, 200,000 gallons of, a tar sands, of tar sands burst from a pipeline, because it's volatile. It burst from the pipeline. It spilled in the streets of a subdivision. It forced the evacuation and abandonment of 22 homes. Residents were exposed to high levels of benzene. Benzene is a known carcinogen. And hydrogen sulfide. People in this community, not some made up mystical community or mythical community, in this community, they suffered dizziness, nausea, headaches, respiratory problems, all classic symptoms of exposure to the chemicals found in the tar sands. So remember this picture, and remember the picture of the filthy, dirty oil and the pet coke, because a picture tells a thousand words. And that's the picture my friends want to make a reality in America. Their first great bill, their first great contribution to the economy, 35 jobs. Please, we can do better. We can work together on a highway bill, on a transportation bill. We do so well on that. And we can add millions of jobs, especially in the construction industry. And now there's the issue of climate change. Now, we know we're dealing with a lot of deniers on the other side of the aisle. They deny climate change is real. It doesn't matter what you tell them. July was the hottest month. August was the hottest month. September was the hottest month. In 2014. We know what's happening. The world knows what's happening. Well, we have deniers here. So they deny any problem, and they go rush to build the Keystone Pipeline. Now, what happens here is the Keystone Pipeline will undermine our efforts to address climate change. The State Department's own analysis says a barrel of tar sands oil carried by the Keystone Tar Sands Pipeline will create at least 17% more carbon pollution than domestic oil. Peer-reviewed research estimates the increase in oil consumption caused by the Keystone could result in up to 110 million metric tons of carbon pollution each year, four times the State Department estimates. So this is even more than the State Department says. And the source there is Erickson et al., Nature's Climate Change, August 10th. That's a peer-reviewed study as well. So this is equivalent to carbon pollution of adding 23 million new cars to the road. 23 million new cars to the road 
or building 29 coal-fired uh, plants. So the State Department is very modest in its projection, and even that's too much. Um, and here's more. Here's the State Department. That's the 17% quote. And it could add up to an additional 27 million metric tons of carbon each year. That's more the State Department. So this is their modest conclusion. And we believe the peer-reviewed studies show it's far worse than even the State Department uh, says. So again, if you don't believe that climate change is a problem, I'm really sorry for your constituency. Because let me tell you what scientists are saying. And, and, and I'm saying it's 98% of scientists. Let's be clear. 98% of scientists say climate change is real. 2% say we're not so sure. So my friends side with the 2%. Supposing one of my friends didn't feel well and went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I'm sorry to tell you this, sir, but you have an, a cancer that is raging over your body, and we need to operate today. And you say, I want a second opinion. That's good. And you go to a second opinion, and the second doctor says, absolutely, you better get that operation. And you say, well, I want a third opinion. All right, I understand it. You go for a third opinion. Absolutely, those two doctors were right. But you keep going, and you get nine opinions that all say, sir, you're a dead man if you don't get this operation. And then you find the 10th. And he says, hey, you know, just go on a vegetarian diet. You'll be fine. If you listen to that one out of 10 doctors, there's something wrong with you. It's just like big tobacco. They did the same thing. They said, oh, tobacco's fine, not a problem. Until we realized that it was a whole campaign by the big tobacco companies to turn us away from the facts that tobacco causes cancer. And, and that's the truth. And guess what we found out? In a union of concerned scientists, expose. They found out that the same people that led that fight of tobacco denial are leading the fight of climate denial. You know, if this was just going to hurt you, I say to my Republican friends rhetorically, I don't care. I mean, I'd be really sad and sorry if one of my friends went to the doctor and didn't listen to the best advice. But you know what? That hurts him. I'd be miserable. I'd try to talk him out of it. But this is about my constituents and the people of this country. And I got to say, this is wrong. This is just wrong. And this is an opportunity to bring the parties together. We could have done it around so many issues, in particular, the highway bill. So common sense tells us this isn't the right thing to do. We're looking at unleashing this dirty, filthy oil. It's going to be harmful to our family's health. It's going to worsen the impacts of climate change. It's not going to create the jobs we need to create. And again, I urge my colleagues, vote no on this thing. It's not ready for prime time. There are going to be amendments that are going to re reveal the fact that if we go forward with this thing, it's actually going to raise gas prices for Americans, because all this stuff is going to be exported. Even the tar sands that is now currently in America, they're going to export it because of the world market. And we're going to have amendments that are going to show that. We, this bill doesn't even have made an America amendment to it. We're going to offer that. Why don't we make this deal here? Why don't we put people to work here? It's, that's not in this bill. This bill is not ready. This bill does not help us. This bill hurts us. And I know my friends came here to make this country better. I, I, don't, I think they think it helps. I don't question that. But if you look at all the facts, and I've got them lined up here, one after the other, whether it's the jobs impact, the health impacts, who benefits, who gets hurt, it's pretty clear. It's on the record. All you have to do is look at it. 
Don't shop around for a doctor who are going to tell you, you know, this is a good deal. Because they've already spoken. It's not a good deal. And we can do so much better. And I hope, because I think it's going to be a contentious debate, I hope we turn to, after this, the highway bill. And my friend Jim Inhoff and I, who work so well together, and my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and across the, uh, the Capitol on the other side, the House, can finally come together and do something that will send a strong signal to the American people that the election just ended, now let's govern. But when you bring things before the body that some of us feel are so detrimental to the American people, you know, I'm, I'm willing to vote at midnight about it. It's okay with me. We'll vote at midnight, we'll vote at one in the morning. I don't care what time we vote. But why are we taking this up? This is not what we should be doing. S1, I've looked at some of the S1 bills that the Democrats have put forward, and they all really have mostly have to do with creating a lot of jobs or making sure there's equal weight pay for equal work or making sure the minimum wage is increased. We could be doing all those things together. So it is with um, you know, pride that I stand here again for my state. It is with uh, no animosity about the election. It was hard fought and hard won. But I think this is an enormous mistake, and I will continue to stand on my feet as long as it takes to make the case as to why I think it's wrong, make the case for why I think there's so much else we could do for the good of our people. And I thank you, Mr. President, for your courtesies, and I would yield the floor.